Well, thank you very much for, for coming. And um, I had given up. I thought that we'd lost touch. And uh, so we're, we're having, you know, this, this, this class, I was planning on focusing on the Philippines, World War II. And, but um, I really, I, honestly, I felt disheartened because I felt that we had lost contact and I wasn't going to be able to bring you. But then I got the email today from Bev and I think called back within a minute or something like that. Yeah. And, and we got things set up. <laughs> so I'm really grateful uh, that you're here. It's a real, it's a real privilege to, to have you here. Uh, let's just start off. You, um, uh, Val, you said that, um, or Bev, you said that Val took some classes here at JVU about 70 years ago. Is, <laughs> is that right? Tell us a little bit about. Well, I was uh, in school JVU. over Ozark Academy. Uh -huh. And I was interested in, in voice training, and they didn't feel they had the expertise to work uh, do with work with me on that. So John Brown had some great instructors, including Mabel Lyson, and she was one of the two instructors that I had from John Brown in uh, voice. And how long ago was that? 1941, 42, and 43. Wow! So before you went to the war? Yes. Yes. Wow. Has JVU changed at all since 1941? Pardon? Has JVU changed at all since 1941? Oh, yeah. oh my, yes. Yeah. It's expanded. It's a beautiful place. Sure. All right. Well, let's, so we have our list of questions here. We don't have to follow them slavishly. Okay. But um, let me pitch this question to, to both of you. Because um, folks from your generation usually remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor. Is that, is that right in your case? Beth, how about you? What, what do you remember about Pearl I was, Harbor? I was at a 12th grade friend's birthday party uh -huh. and her father came in and said Pearl Harbor had been attacked. We were just kids. We hardly knew what that meant. Yeah. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? Yeah. No, never Not heard of it. at that time. Did you even know that, the, that Hawaii was under the American flag at that time? No, not really. <laughs> yeah. How, how about you? What do you remember about Pearl Harbor? Well, I don't remember where I was exactly that day, but I was, I knew what the political situation was, and I knew that uh, war, war was very likely. Yeah. What year were you born? Uh, 1924. 1924. So help me out, you guys, real quick. So in, in, at the end of 41, then what is that? How old does that make Val? Mm. Seventeen, so you were seventeen. So Pearl Harbor hits. You're right at you're right at you know the early edge of military age. You must have known that if we're going to war, that you would probably get involved somehow. Oh uh, yes, <clears throat> uh, the uh, the uh, government had put into effect the uh, way way of uh, acquiring the soldiers of drafting them. We don't do that anymore, but that's what, the way it was done then. Yeah. And I knew that, that uh, at my age I would soon be drafted, and I understood that very well. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, what, what's the, who's the first president you remember? First president? The first U.S. president that, that you remember, and then Bev, we'll hear from Bev. What, who's, what's the first president you remember? Who's the first U.S. president? Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt? Did your family like Roosevelt? Oh yes, my family was democratic. Oh yeah, <laughs> so vote, voted for him four times then? Pardon? Voted for Franklin Roosevelt four times then? I mean, all, all four elections for I Franklin Roosevelt? I wouldn't have known You're too young. Yeah, about yeah. the voting. Okay. How about, how, who's the first president Hoover, you remember? I remember Hoover, the first election I remember was between Hoover and Roosevelt. 1932, right? Yes. Election of 32. Yeah. Who, who did your family vote for? I really don't know. They didn't no. discuss politics with me. <laughs> oh, okay. Was your family pro Roosevelt or on the or more on the Republican side at the time? Well, they were Republicans. Okay. Although they were Republicans with some reservations, well, so okay. uh, uh, we were good friends with a number of uh, both uh, Republicans and Democrats. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you remember when your draft notice came? Oh yes. <laughs> tell us. Tell us about your draft notice. Uh, well, I was playing a baseball game with the other kids in high school there, and somebody came running down from the administration building with this little card in his hand, and he said, it's come, it's come. Okay. Everybody knew that uh, we were going to be drafted, but 
when the card came away, um, they they were some of them might might have been happy about it. I'm not sure, but I wasn't. You weren't happy about it. No. <laughs> what year was that? Do you remember? Was yes, it, it was 1943. Or? Yeah, I mean, for, the war's been going on for a while by 43. Yeah. yeah. So you weren't happy about it. <clears throat> well, I had planned to be a doctor, and I uh, had my in my mind arrangements made to go to medical school and everything. And I saw this as a break, a serious break in my plans. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at the same time, though, did you want to, well, I guess, you know, what I hear from the time is that everybody, that the country is very unified. Yeah, the they were. The country was very unified. Yeah. So it wasn't that you didn't want to do something for your country. You were, oh, you no. were involved in that somehow. But yes, yeah. uh, I was. Uh, I felt honored in a way to be drafted and and take a, a more active part than I had anticipated mm -hmm. in the war. I realized that uh, the my my parents were too old. My uh, many of my friends were too young. And somebody had to be there to do that, do that job. Yeah, to go in the military. Yeah. Well, and of course, by '43, I mean, can't think of a gentle way to say it. There are a lot of guys who went in '42 who aren't able to fight anymore. Yeah. And they have to be replaced. Yeah. Right. And and so that's that's sure. part of it. Part of it as well. Oh yeah. How did the Let's just talk about sort of the home front for a little bit, because people who lived through that time do say that that was the time when the country was more unified than ever. Definitely. That the country was absolutely unified. Yes. Um, could you describe that, Bev? Do you remember the country being very unified during World War II? You were too young. You were too young, you weren't paying a lot of attention. So what, what, what memories do you have of, of how people pulled together? For the well, war? Uh, Almost everybody had a relative in the service, and when you have somebody, a, a close friend, a relative in the service, then you're you're interested, and you're anxious to know whether they're safe or not, whether they're making progress in the the area of war where where they happen to be stationed. Mm -hmm. If you know, most of us never knew. Uh, most of the civilians never knew where their loved one was um, for secrecy reasons. Because the mail was censored and... Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. You just go to an APO number, they called it. Right. Do you remember the the drives they did here in the country, collecting metal? Oh, or sure. And then the, um, I mean, as, as, a, as a kid, you're not allowed to eat as much sugar as you might have before, we, right? We couldn't make candy at home because we didn't have sugar. <laughs> yeah, because the sugar goes to the soldiers, right? The soldiers and sailors. So you have to ration. And Did you participate in those things where you go door to door collecting pots and pans and things like that? No, you don't remember any of that? Did, did you do any, any of that sort of thing? Uh, um, our, our, my, my involvement was a little more personal. I had a brother who was a Marine. He'd gone in years before, three and a half years before the war began. and. So <clears throat> he knew situations that needed uh, help, and uh, if, if if it was clothing, we we would find clothing somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People were very good about donating things, do, uh, including metals, uh, aluminum in particular. Right. And our country was quite, really quite unified. It's. Somewhat different now. It's a little bit different today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, very, very unified. Bev, did you uh, did you have any relatives in the war? No, but we uh, fixed up packages to go to the soldiers. We heard that they needed things like uh, candy, mm -hmm. and we even put cigarettes in there. We didn't know us that at that time how bad cigarettes were. So you're sending candy and cigarettes and bad things to the to the soldiers, but but at least you don't have any candy or candy for yourself, right? No. So yeah, so your teeth are doing okay. Yeah, but the the soldiers. Well, let's let's go to the to the next one then. So you got into the army. So the the answer this to the next question that the students have is how did you get into the army? You got into the army because Uncle Sam 
invited you, right, and, and sent you the telegram? Well, when I was inducted, I was inducted with the, uh, 99 other fellows there in Nebraska. Almost all of them were from the university, and, uh, and we uh, had some tests, of course, and there were seven of us that were called out and told that we had qualified for officer training, for flight training, or any other branch we chose. And uh, I dearly wanted to fly, but uh, I thought with my convictions on killing that I would be better off um, as a medic if I could get into that branch. Yeah. Now, they don't often give you your choice, mm -hmm. and they didn't really give me much choice there. I just told them I couldn't, I wouldn't be flying, I wouldn't be taking officer's training, but I would uh, be open to, to medics if, if it was possible. Yeah. As it turned out, it worked. <laughs> yeah, and, this, and so this was a way to, to serve, but without having to engage in, I mean, war obviously is about killing. Yeah. But ha without having to engage in killing, but actually engage in, you know, helping and patching people up. And yeah, well, saving I'd, had, life. yeah. I'd had uh, nurses and doctors and my ancestry there, and I liked the idea of helping people. That was, uh, my mother had a picture of a doctor sitting beside a bedside of a little girl that's sick, and I used to think that that would be a nice thing to do, to, to be a doctor. And uh, it was always in the back of my mind. And my dad was a lawman, and he never once drew his weapon in all his career in on business. We knew what guns were, and we weren't afraid of them or anything. It didn't bother us. Uh, but I knew very well what a gun could do, and I didn't feel that I could look at somebody in the face and, and then shoot them. I couldn't do that. <laughs> so I chose sure. I chose to go in as a, what they call 1A0. 1A meant your fr first class mentally and physically. If you had the O after it, that means you objected to, to carrying a weapon. Yeah. And there were times when the guys would kid me about it a little bit, and they'd say, uh, well, you sure wonder when you get up in the front. And actually, they were right. There were times when I kind of wished I'd had one. Wish you had a gun. There but I had made my decision, and, and I stuck with it. Wow, yeah. <laughs> and um, this, you were Seventh-day Adventist, right? Yes. And so I, there's a, I think there's a movie that came out not long ago. What's it? Hacksaw Ridge. Hacksaw Ridge about a Seventh-day Adventist, also in the Pacific, wasn't he, mm -hmm. Seth? I think. Yeah. Who? Not not necessarily a pacifist. I mean, you'll engage oh, in no. this process. Uh -huh. So not a pacifist. Nothing wrong with being a pacifist, but not a pacifist. But but yeah, you want to be involved in some other way, not in the actual act of. Yeah, he was a medic also. Uh, I have not seen that movie, and I'm really not sure I want to. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's, it's, they tell me it's pretty realistic. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah. So that that so then we we know the answer to the question is is that you were a medic, and and we've learned that yeah. that you became a medic. I mean, you you expressed an interest in being a doctor, so it's a little bit like that, and. <laughs> And you're not opposed to the war effort, but you just didn't want to be involved in the in the shooting. That's right. So you got into the war, you know, fairly late, fairly yeah. late, or about mid midway, I guess. Mm -hmm. When did you first get into the war zone? I mean, you, you sort of cross that boundary from the world of safety to the world um, of war. I went through three months of primary or uh, basic training, and then I went through four months of dental technicians training <laughs> and then I had a month or two well they were fooling around trying to decide where to put me and right after that it would be nine of uh, four, seven eight it was about nine months after I went in when I actually got into the uh, active uh, war zone okay and was that was the Philippines the first war zone you got into or where was the first no war? that was before the invasion of the Philippines they sent me to New Guinea first, New Guinea, okay. and I was involved in the New Guinea battle. And then, you were. then they, uh, I was assigned to the 360th uh, Station Hospital, which was a little thing. I don't, maybe you remember these uh, mass programs used to be on TV. Mm -hmm. And our little hospital was just about like that. And uh, we were 
arranged to be highly mobile, and our hospital could be taken down and set up in a matter of a few hours. Wow. So uh, we were quite active. <laughs> so if we think about, you know, sort of the line of medics, so you've got the medics who are with the, the soldiers in, in combat, and then are you one, and then you have the hospitals, like the hospital ships back here. Yeah. You're kind of in between the uh, battle yeah. zone and the, you and got the hospitals, the hospital ships. We, uh, if a man was wounded, he would uh, he would call a medic and the corpsman would be there to take care of him. And then the corpsman, once he'd done what he could, he immediately sent him back to our hospital. Yeah. So we got patients within, oh, anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour after they were wounded. Yeah. And I, I, the question down here, I, I think I, I have it somewhere. Um, I imagine it wasn't only Americans who came to your hospital. Did oh, you, I know. Who, what other nationalities? We, well, we had you Japanese have? prisoners, wounded Japanese prisoners that we cared for. Really? We had uh, many Filipinos that we cared for. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did that, you know, given what we know about the feelings, um, during World War II, you know, World War II in the Pacific was so intense that the hatred, you know, was so intense and understandable from the psychological point of view. It was just so, so intense. What difference did it make, if any, when you saw that the patient coming now is a wounded Japanese? No. Maybe, maybe to you or to another person or? Personally, none. No difference. If a, if a guy was bleeding, you stop the bleeding. If he's not breathing, you start him breathing. Uh, and it doesn't matter what, what color his skin was, at least to me. Now, it did to some of the doctors that had been over there a while. What, what did you see? Uh, well, the first, second night I was ashore in Luzon. <clears throat> Luzon is a big island in the Philippines. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, MacArthur made an invasion on the, uh, at uh, Lingayan Gulf which is halfway up on the uh, west side of Luzon. And we were in there on the, we were brought in on the third day. And the second night I was ashore, we had an air raid, Japanese planes overhead. And we had two s fairly small tents with Japanese prisoners. And they were ordered to close the, get in there, close the tent flap, don't look out at all, under any circumstances. And we had Filipino guards there. And that second night, uh, during the air raid, uh, one of those Jap prisoners raised up the tent flap just a little bit and looked out. And the Filipino guard shot him instantly. Mm. And the bullet went through his head. And then it went into that second tent and hit another Jap prisoner who had a who had lost a leg, hit him in the side, and they brought him up to the operating room there during blackout conditions. And they got as far as the doorway to the operating room on with this young fellow on the litter. And <clears throat> the doctors inside, there were two doctors inside and two just outside the door. And the ones inside had been over there for quite a while. And they didn't have any use for Jeff's. And they said, you can't bring it SOB in here. And the two doctors outside said, he's going to die very shortly if we don't bring him in. And they, there was a Filipino guard there. And this, uh, he walked up to this, uh, so, uh, this Jap Japanese soldier who was bleeding to death. His blood was pouring out of his right side there. Mm. And he kicked him. Mm. And uh, I said, uh, he, he said something in, in a language I didn't know. And so I turned to my interpreter and I said, what's he saying, what's he saying? And he says, he said, he's saying bow, bow, like the Japanese used to do. Mm. Uh, of course, so. Mm. It, sometimes war brings out the worst of people. But we had two doctors on, on each side there, both the ones inside and the ones outside. The ones inside wouldn't let him in and the ones outside insisted they had to operate on him immediately. He died there. And, within a minute or so of uh -huh. the time I got there. So you, you witnessed all of this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're, you're just a young enlisted yeah. soldier, so there's not yeah. much you can say to these officers, but no. do you remember what your thoughts were? Yes. Uh, 
I was kind of angry with the guys that, that uh, the two doctors that were inside, because I could see that this kid was going to die very shortly. He'd already lost a leg, mm -hmm. and he didn't have much blood to spare, and the blood was pouring out of that right side, and I believe the, the bullet must have struck the aorta mm -hmm. with the volume of blood that was coming out there, and he went into the chain-soaked breathing, and it was clear that he was on his, he didn't have many breaths left. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I felt uh, I, I, that he was Japanese didn't make any difference to me. I just knew what was happening and what was going to happen. Sure. And unfortunately, it happened. Yeah. Did you ever make an attempt to, I don't know how to put it, but to try to, you know, reach out to a, a Japanese and to sort of. <laughs> let him get that message from you? It might have been difficult in that context, or you're so busy and exhausted, but do you remember ever sort of attempting to some way let a Japanese know that, you know, Yes, see one occasion. <laughs> yeah. most, most of the occasions were cases where the fellows were badly wounded and, and, and they were, they needed the medical care I could give, and when you're in that situation, you can't think too much about other things, you concentrate on whether he's breathing, whether he's bleeding, and you take care of those things as just as fast as you can. Yeah. And another time, uh, later, after the war was over, uh, I went for a stroll up north of our hospital when I had a few minutes, and I found a prison camp, a Japanese prison camp. And <clears throat> one man was by himself, and he had a tripod and a piece of board on that tripod, and what he was doing was away from my face. But I walked up there close to the fence, and he turned that tripod around, and I saw a beautiful painting. Mm -hmm. He had painted a, a picture of a, a mountain scene with, well, I don't need to describe it, it was beautiful, and it had flowers, and, and obviously this man was talented. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me kind of wonderingly, and so I said, thumbs up, and he got the message, and he grinned. He had one tooth in his mouth. <laughs> He'd been starving uh, oh, up wow. to that point. Wow. But uh, that was yeah. one, the one time when I had a contact, personal contact, yeah. of that, that guy. And this was after the war had ended. Oh, yeah. yeah. But he was a Japanese prisoner who was yes. just kind of loose. Huh? He was a Japanese yeah. prisoner, but he, he was uh, in a, <clears throat> a chain link compound. Yeah. yeah. And there was a guard guard station just a few yards away, so mm -hmm. they weren't going anywhere. Yeah. I think I just have one other question in my mind, and then we'll we'll go back to the sheet, and again, we don't have to go through everything that's here, although actually this question is on the on the sheet, the question about the, the nurses. I, I think I recall when you and I spoke a couple months ago um, that, did you have nurses, American nurses who came? Not at first. As well? Not okay. at first. Uh, it was felt that there, our situation was kind of dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> we were really close to the front lines there. So we didn't have lady nurses up until fairly late in the war. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, yeah, they were some trouble. We had to have a special compound for them and, and guards and all mm -hmm. for them. But the ones I worked with, with one exception, were hardworking, desperately anxious to, to do something. Uh, and <clears throat> one I remember was a uh, little overly anxious. She, she became a kind of a surrogate mother to each of these boys that came in wounded. And she would, I, I saw her cry sometimes when she was working on these people. And that's not a good way to, for a, a nurse or a, or a technician to operate. Mm -hmm. You need to put aside the feelings of pity uh, and concentrate on the technical aspect of keeping him breathing, keeping him from bleeding to death, mm -hmm. uh, and put aside any thought, thought for the future. This girl couldn't do that. She lasted about two months, yeah. and I sent her home. And the stress just, just got, got yeah. to her. I imagine, again, I don't know about your hospital, because your hospital is pretty close to the front, but I imagine a lot of the guys who weren't too badly wounded, 
it must have been, um, I don't know how to put it, um, I mean, just nice for them to see uh, a woman from the States. Oh, right? yeah. I imagine for a lot of them, that's yeah. just kind of, it's a reminder of home. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, the, the psychologically it was a great thing for some of those poor guys, <clears throat> but uh, most of their, the, the nurses that I worked with were there on business. There was a little romance once in a while, I heard about it anyway, mm -hmm. but uh, they were there for business and they did their job. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot of empathy for them. Yeah, so these are army nurses? Yeah, army, army nurses, nurses, yeah. Right. The, none of them almost none of them minded getting their hands dirty, uh, doing what had to be done. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. When did, you, when did you come home from the Philippines? Did you, you, so you stayed a while after the war was done? Uh, yeah, um, uh, they have to close up the hospitals and, and they have to ship everybody somewhere. Yeah. And we kept uh, our patients as short a period of time as possible before shipping them back. We'd stabilize them, make sure they were, they were breathing, their heart was beating right, yeah. <laughs> and that they could withstand a trip to, back to the bigger hospital. Yeah. Uh, when, our, I, I was, when our hospital, little hospital closed there, I was hoping I would go home immediately. It didn't happen. <laughs> I didn't have enough points as, as, they, I were, as the arrangement was at that time to go home at that time. So I was there to close the hospital. And our, our urologist walked in and took both of the, the uh, little instruments that we have that the urologist use. Mm -hmm. And I said, he's a good friend of mine, so I joked around with him a little bit. And I said, you're not gonna steal those, are you? And he laughed and he said, well, the army's taking years off of my life here, and he said, I'm taking these with me. And he said, besides, you're going to just dump this stuff in the bay. And I said, no, they're going to take it home and put it on the market. And he said, no, they won't. So my job was to pack up everything in the operating rooms, and I had engineers that were doing that, but I had to supervise it. We put, we put all that stuff on trucks, and I knew the truck drivers, and so the next day, I asked the truck driver, what happened with the stuff? What did you do with it? And he said, they took it out in the middle of Manila Bay and dumped it. <laughs> yeah. well, he was right. Yeah. So he yeah. knew more about it, about it than I did. I got into trouble over that, in a way, because I was with another hospital, a bigger hospital that closed. And a young nurse from the civilian hospital came there when she knew we were closing. And she said, Sergeant, could you could you get some of these bandages and things, bandages and things for us? And she said, we're having to use old bandages. We wash them in the river and then bring them up and use them again and again. And I said, I can't promise a thing, but I said, I'll try. So I went over to the supply sergeant and I said, these people around here have been good to you and you've been good to them. I knew he had some kind of an angle. He was gonna be making money somewhere. But, uh, so I wanted to let him know that I could tattle on him if I had to. And uh, I said, these people need bandages, they need medicines, they need all these other things. This young lady that came to me was begging about it and she, her tears were coming down her face and she was asking for help. And so I told the, this supply sergeant, let's see if we can get a little something for her. Well, he said, come back in a couple hours. Two hours later came back and he had two six by six trucks loaded with stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I don't know about this. <laughs> and I, I talked to the, my supervising doctor mm -hmm. and I told him I want to help these people. And he turned away from me and he says, whatever happens, I'm not to know a thing about it. And then I began to realize that I was messing with something that might get me in trouble. But I went ahead with it. And we, the, his, his sergeants, uh, the, the supply sergeants, drivers, drove that stuff over to the hospital and unloaded it and came back during the night and nobody would see it. Nobody should see it. And then the people 
that same nurse, Filipino nurse, came back to me and she wanted to thank me for it. And I said, shh, don't say anything about this to anybody. Well, a few days later, they held a party to celebrate our being there. And I was desperately afraid they were going to say something in public. But they were all so nice about it. They came around me and uh, around to me privately, and each one said, thank you, Sergeant, thank you, Sergeant, thank you, Sergeant, without going into any details. And for months after that, I wondered if I was going to get in trouble over it. But uh, why, why? Because it was unauthorized to give them that stuff? No, or I didn't have any authority to do that. Right. <laughs> and it would have, I, I thought, yeah. with my experience, it would all be dumped in Manila Bay again. I didn't yeah. want to see that happen. And this girl really touched my heart, and so yeah. we got that done, but it was off the record. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm sure everybody, no one, no one would complain now. Right? Well, the right thing to do. I don't know. If there was some sharp young lieutenant who was wanted to make his name for himself, why well, he'd say, "Hey, Sergeant Perry right, wants yeah. the black market." All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you gotta follow the rules. Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, let me ask you a couple questions, and we'll we'll see if the if the, the students uh, have some questions. We've kind of touched on this already, sort of returning to the the you know the relationship between Americans and Japanese, also Filipinos and Japanese, and we've kind of touched on this already. But I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. But it just seems in the Pacific War there was so much. There was a level of hatred. There was an yeah. intensity of hatred yeah. that didn't exist in the European War, even yeah. though, as bad as the Nazis were, right? Of course, most American soldiers don't know what the Nazis are doing until the end of the war. Yeah. But in in the Pacific, it's such a it's such an awful, intense war that yeah. involves so much hatred. Why? What's what do you think is the reason for that? Why was that hatred so intense in that war? Well, this gets into a little, a little into philosophy, but there was a, a clique in Japan of the military, particularly the army military, and they were they had sort of taken over the government, and that they were in a position to force the government to do what they wanted to do. So uh, their their uh, belief in Bushido and in That's the uh, military code. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was kind of spread over all the, the military. And so when a, an, an American, a Briton, or somebody else was captured, he was considered to be a real lowlife because he allowed himself to be captured. The Japanese theory was you don't allow yourself to be captured. If one of them were captured, why, he was, he was rejected by his family and his, uh, uh, in theory and also by his uh, military friends. <clears throat> so there was that aspect that gave them uh, an attitude that uh, prisoners just don't matter. So they would do some things that uh, really turn your stomach. Um, I went to church there in Baguio one time, and here was a lady, middle-aged with, or she looked middle-aged, with four young children including a baby at her breast, but no man there. And so I asked somebody, Where, where's her husband? And they told me uh, when Baguio, Baguio was, was the headquarters for, Jap for the Japanese army, including General Yamashita, and he surrounded the city with soldiers to prevent any Filipinos from leaving hoping that that would prevent the Americans from bombing the city. Mm. Uh, so the husband of this lady had found a secret way of getting out of the city, and he was taking people, civilians, out to his secret way. And he was captured, and he was tortured to death. Mm. And he left this widow with four little kids. Uh, oh. yeah. that, that was repeated over and over. And that, yeah. <coughs> For me, it was hard to take, but I, I realized that there was something back there somewhere that was causing this, because that's not a normal human reaction. Right, that kind of brutality. Most of us want to help each other. Yeah. 
When I was in the Philippines, I talked with a, a lady who was a young child when the Japanese invaded, and she had all sorts of stories of oh, yeah. just the atrocities she saw uh, in, in Bhutan. Um, did you have the feeling from what you saw that the Filipinos were glad that the Americans had returned? Oh, yes. The, by far, the great, the great majority of them did. Uh, they w were just delighted to, to see us. The, the first day we were ashore, <clears throat> we went out the first morning, we, I went out for breakfast, and, and I got the stuff in my kit, my little <laughs> lunch kit, and I started stepping away, and here's a little kid beside me. There's a whole string of little kids there, big, beautiful eyes, you know. And they have these little cans, and they're holding them up. So I dumped my breakfast in, and it went on. Second day, it was the same thing. The third day, they had chain link fence around the <laughs> lunch uh, uh, arrangements there. So you could eat without. Yeah, and I, I got after a sergeant, staff sergeant there, and outranked me. And I said, I'd, I'd like to give something to the kids. And he said, well, don't worry, Sarge, there's, there's food coming in for the civilians. Mm -hmm. So they soon had, sure. were well supplied. Sure. Did you make it into Manila yourself? Only after the war was over and yeah. where, where I boarded the ship. How, how, just based on what you saw, how much destruction was there in the city of Manila? Uh, according to the authorities I've read, the city of Manila suffered more than any other city in the World War II, with the exception of uh, a city in Poland, I forgot the name yeah. of it. You mean it was, it was, how much of it was destroyed? Oh my, it was in bad shape. Yeah. Uh, when when I when we first went in, we stopped in Manila Bay, Manila Bay briefly, <laughs> and I could see the our Marine bombers dive bombing the city, mm -hmm. and I learned later that there was a outlaw group of Japanese sailors that refused to surrender when their commanding officer ordered them to. And they stayed there, and so our Marines, Marine uh, uh, dive bombers went in there and did their work. Did their work. Yeah, That's, that was part of the destruction of Manila. Yeah, yeah. Anybody in the class have any questions right now? Take a couple, take a question or two before we carry on. Any questions from you guys? What was like the most intense, like how busy could it get in on like some days with wounded coming in? Were there some days where you had so many that you couldn't take care of them all and you had to pick and choose or was there always enough, mm -hmm. were there always enough medical staff on hand to take care of wounded? Were you able to hear that? No. Were there, were there days where there were so many wounded that that the hospital was overwhelmed and wasn't really able to keep oh, up? Oh, the first day we opened, first day we were ashore, the soldiers had been aboard, had been on land for three days. This was the third day for them. But I, I went and got some sleep after we stopped uh, at our camp, where we made camp. And I got three or four hours sleep, and then I went tearing back to the hospital. The hospital was full, that is, we were in a, fairly large high school the, where the Filipinos, Philippine high school, the hospital was full and the yard outside the hospital was also full. Uh, it just happened in, in a few hours <clears throat> and we were, we were packed full. So there must have been times where you went more than 24 hours without sleep. Oh, just, oh yeah. yeah. I, I was, technically we were on 12 hour shifts, but nobody ever quit. If there was work that still had to be done, the guys would stay there and do it. The nurses would too. Sure. And I mean, as intense as some of that fighting was, you, you've got wounded just coming back. Yeah, in yeah. A steady stream. Yeah, right? you don't turn your back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, you've, you've, we, there's a question here about is there room for compassion in a sure. war zone? And, and you've, you've kind of touched on, on that one already. and. It sounds like we have a question here about working with Filipino nationals, and it sounds like you had Filipinos working with you in the hospital compound. Yes. 
Yes, uh, my interpreter uh, could speak seven of the seven languages, English and Spanish, and then five of the dialects, uh, wow. Pangasinan, uh, Ilocano, and some more. Wow. He'd been an accountant in Manila before the war, and now he was working as my uh, interpreter. Uh, yeah. He was actually absolutely irreplaceable. Right. And there were times when he could he could do things that I couldn't have done. Yeah. Well, I was. I heard somebody sobbing one night, and I walked back and forth among the beds, and at certain points, the sobbing would stop, and I couldn't find out who was having this problem, so I turned to Numesio. And I said, Numisio, let's, let's find this man. So he went one way and I went another way, and we finally found a 17-year-old Filipino kid that was crying. And no. I said, ask him what's wrong. So he talked in that language, whatever it was, and he turned around to me and he said, he's hungry. Mm. Hungry? How can he be hungry? Or, or, Dietitians were doing, our dietitian, well, we had one, was giving him great food, far better than the GIs were getting, trying to get him to eat. And I said, well, what does he want? And they talked back and forth, he wants rice. Mm. <laughs> he wants rice. <laughs> well, he had rice in 10 minutes, and he, he was better then. <laughs> he didn't feel full unless he had rice. No, you, yeah. we were trying to feed him these fine occidental dishes. Oh, yeah. He wanted yeah. rice. Nice American food, but he wanted rice. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me ask, a, I'll ask a couple more questions, then we'll, we'll see if the, if the students have uh, questions before we wrap up. Um, let me see, I think Manila is liberated, and yeah. about March 45 is when that's wrapped up, about yeah. March 45. Of course, uh, you know, Okinawa is still to come. Yeah. That's one of the toughest fights of the war. Um, planning for the invasion of Japan, and and everybody just assumes that's going to be a, a huge bloodbath. Yeah. But then, uh, but then you have the two atomic bombs, Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima, August '45. Do you remember when you heard news about? The bombs and and oh, very remember, much. What, what, yeah. what do you recollect about? Hearing well, I had a little chemistry, and I was trying to figure out what kind of chemistry could cr destroy a whole city. One bomb, yeah. With one bomb, and I, I thought of all the reactions that I knew, and nothing really made any sense. And then after a few days, when we found out it was based on an entirely different principle, yeah, uh, it was my pleasure later to meet the uh, pilot of the plane that dropped the bomb. Mm -hmm. well, I, was I think you saw at, it at the memoir there. that he wrote. He wrote a memoir here. Yeah. Uh -huh. you've, got, you've got the picture of the pilot yeah. of the NLA. Yeah. yeah, I met him in, in Fayetteville when he was selling his book. Oh, okay. Do you remember VJ Day, Victory Over Japan Day? Did I ever? Do you remember, do you remember VJ Day when, when the news came through that, uh, that Japan had yes. surrendered? Although it was no big deal because I still had patients to take uh -huh. care of and, and I couldn't stop that for cel to celebrate or anything. It was just another work day, just but another work day there was you. that one blessed thought in my mind. Eventually I'm going home. Yeah, right. <laughs> Dr. Drake, who was my chief of surgery, had a big book that he showed me after the war, after the war ended and he showed me the city where we would be going in. He showed me the, the uh, building that the hospital would be in. He showed me the room that I would have as an office. And he even showed me my telephone number, what, what my telephone number would have been. Mm. And he, we talked about, uh, uh, we were assigned to be the first medical unit of, ashore. In uh, Japan. In the invasion of Japan. Oh, boy. So you were planning on that. And after he got done showing me these things, he said, Val, uh, they expect a 50% casualty rate the first day. And I, when you're young, you think you're bulletproof. 
after a little while in the service, you learn you're not. And uh, when they, when he showed me that, I was thankful to God that the war was over. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you know, if, if the casualty rates uh, 50 percent the first day, your chance of living five days are pretty small. Do you know other? I mean, were there other conscientious objector medics who were killed in in combat? Oh or yeah. Killed because of yeah. bombs and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so even though they themselves did not fight, I mean, they were still casualties of war. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was uh, when I was assigned. They gave us a, what they call a brassard that fits on your sleeve and has a big red cross on it. They said, take that off. Why? Why did they tell you to take it off? Because the Jap Japanese soldiers made that a special target. Yeah. Of course, that's a difference in Europe, right? I mean, as yeah. it's kind of confusing. As bad as the Nazis are, <laughs> though, they won't shoot at the medics. They, That's right. It's curious yeah. they'll respect that law of war. Yeah. But um, but the Japanese, you actually make yourself a target. Oh yeah. That. No, I never saw anybody wear those. Yeah. And and but some medics were. It sounds like you like you go along with the idea that as bad as the atomic bombs were, that on the whole they actually cost fewer lives than would have been cost <coughs> had we invaded. So many more Japanese would have died. Obviously, so many more Americans would have died because the Japanese were preparing to fight street to street to street to street all the way through the islands of Japan. Well, back a few years ago, there were letters in the in the uh, Fayetteville paper every uh, <laughs> every uh, on the celebration of the end of the war every year. <clears throat> so I wrote back one year and I laid out my views. But that's true. Unfortunately, that military clique in the, in the Japanese serve army was so strong that they were even training little kids to fight. And they'd say, get a piece of bamboo and sharpen the end of it in a fire, and then you can stick people with it. Uh, and uh, that is not a normal, normal human behavior, but it, it happened. And so I was glad for a number of reasons. And as I've studied this since then, I'm, I, I still feel the same, that overall, it saved a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. As tough as it was. Yeah. 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 You've got, obviously, a lot. Let me, let me ask this question. We'll go to the students one more time, and then we'll, we'll uh, wrap it up. You obviously have a lot of memories oh, yes. of, of this war, obviously, and, and I'm so grateful to you for mm -hmm. coming. Um, is there one particular memory that you found that over the years, I mean, all these many decades now, is there one particular memory that sticks out in your mind most? Yes. What is it? Okay. <laughs> well, I was, I was assigned a ward of, um, what do they call these bone injuries? Orthopedic, orthopedic uh, patients. Every one of those men was in a big cast or in a, um, a tra heavy traction. <clears throat> One morning, a group came in. Not all of them were so badly injured. One fellow had just his two hands bandaged up, and they were like kind of like clubs the way they were bandaged. Mm -hmm. And he he had been hit with a shell that exploded and knocked him cold, mm -hmm. and he didn't know what was under those bandages. So that morning I started unwrapping the bandages and I always tried to talk about something else rather than the actual injuries. Try to talk about home or where it's from or what he's doing, what he did in civilian life. <clears throat> I went through that routine with him as I was unwrapping him and I found one thumb missing on one hand and a couple of fingers and a couple of fingers missing on the other hand. But otherwise he was unhurt. So I said, Mike, uh, where are you from? And he told me, and I said, well, what did you do as a civilian? He said, I was a concert pianist. Uh -huh. 
I wish I hadn't asked him. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that's the, that's, that's kind of the memory that the strongest. Uh, yeah, he's kind of a metaphor for the whole business of war. Mm. It's, it's, it, it's such a waste and it's such an unfortunate thing. And I'm not a politician, so I can't say a war is bad or good. Uh, uh, the one I fought in, I, I guess, was good. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to, I, I, I'm not a judge of that. All I know is that there's a the terrible waste. And the young men who had a wonderful future ahead of them in an instant were invalids for life mm. or worse. Do you, I mean, you know, you're trying to be, you're trying to be nice, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and obviously, you know, that doesn't work out in that situation. Do you remember what you said next? I mean, when, when he responded and said, concert pianist, do you remember where it went after that? Oh, uh, I didn't have anything else to say. Yeah. I finished unwrapping his bandages and dressing it and, and mm -hmm. putting new bandages back on there. But that, that has stuck in my mind sure. as a metaphor for what war is. Yeah. That's a powerful <laughs> story. <laughs> anybody, anybody have a question before we wrap it up? Go ahead, Andrew. How did, if you had any Japanese wounded who were like awake and uh, aware, how did they respond to you treating them? Mm. Were they open to that? Or? How did how did Japanese prisoners who were aware, or Japanese wounded or prisoners who were aware, how did they respond to to you and to the other Americans working on them? Well, uh, that's a good question. They they, they never <laughs> none of them ever thanked me. However, they all cooperated in what I did and what I asked them to do. Uh, I'll tell you one little experience. After the war, we had a prisoner come in with a, a, a hot appendix. And so the first, uh, the, the uh, officer of the day was a good friend of mine. He was a doctor, officer of the day, and it was his job to do the surgery. And he was drunk. And I should have reported him, but I liked the, liked the guy, and so I cooperated with him. And uh, I, we did a spinal uh, anesthetic, that is, I put an arm around the, to take the patient and uh, facing him on, the si on his side, put an arm around his neck and another one behind his legs, and you pull him until he's bent to the point where you can insert a needle between two of the vertebrae, lower, uh, lumbar vertebrae. Well, this day uh, we we did a spinal on him and then put him on his back again. And by the t time we started, well, he should have been well under the anesthesia. And this Dr. Wade took a towel clamp, uh, which has two little points on it, to hold a fabric. And you, you, you pinch the skin gently to be sure the patient's under. I happened to be looking at this Japanese man's face. And he went white, but he never moved, not a muscle. And I had to admire him for that. Mm -hmm. I just screamed out, he kicked the anesthesia, anesthetist to the next county, you know. But he didn't move a muscle. Such, such self-control. Wow. Uh, but we, I, I gave him ether and we put him under and did the surgery and in 15 minutes it was over. Wow. But uh, that was, the training that that man had was just marvelous. Mm. It was scandalous in a way because th that's getting away from normal human reaction again. Was that the feeling that the Japanese were almost like machines or something? That they've been trained and <clears throat> yes. trained in their schools? Uh, so far as I was, training so far as I could tell, yeah. yeah. I'm sure they had loved ones at home, sure, and, yeah. just like I did. Sure. But the contacts I had were strictly business, and uh, I had to admire the, that one. Well, I, I saw that demonstrated another way. One night I was on a detail to bring 
material from the beach up to our, to our hospital. And a jet plane came flying up the coast. He couldn't have been more than 100 or 200 feet high. And there were thousands of guns shooting at him. And how in the world he had the nerve to, to make that flight real steady, real slow. I felt I could have hit him with a rock. But he, he flew up the beach there without flinching. And fortunately, I was so dumb, I was standing out there watching when everybody else was hiding. But uh, I looked around and everybody was gone. And he could have, he should have one burst of the machine gun, you know, and <laughs> that would have been history. But uh, he had the nerve and the, the skill to make that flight without flinching. Again, uh, I, in a way, I admire it. Kind of impressive in a way. In a way, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be, we would never send a, a pilot on a mission like that. Was there um, a fellow medic that you really connected with and stayed uh, friends with after um, war? Was there a, did you maintain close connections with somebody that you served with at, long after the war? Like, did you have a friendship with another medic, for example, that you remained friends with after the war? Well, <laughs> believe it or not, I met a young fellow that I'd gone to school with over at Ozark Academy in the Philippines there, and he and I kept in touch later. Okay. Uh, but other than that, uh, no. Uh, most of us were wanted to get back to civilian life, which, which to us, I guess, meant the life we were familiar with. <laughs> so I didn't really, I kept in touch with some of them for a few years, but uh, eventually uh, but you move on. we lost track of each other. And when did you meet? When did the two of you meet? I'm very happy to say that uh, uh, when I first went to college, before, the, before I got in the service, I was very poor, a flat broke, and I had to work like mad to try to keep, keep going. After the war, I had the GI Bill, and so I made a list of the prettiest girls in school, and I planned to date each one, one by one. <laughs> well, you know, some of them were rich, some of them were, would, would show off, some were... Uh, obviously lazy. Others were had problems that I didn't want to cope with. But then <laughs> this gal happened to set up a party. Do you want to say a word here? Back then, a girl didn't ask a guy out. You know, that was a no-no. So I had to get up a whole party. I met him while we were roller skating at the gymnasium. And I wanted to ask him, so I asked him, we're having a party, want to join us? It didn't sound so bad that way. Well she, well, she was on my list of the prettiest girls in school, and I was delighted to make this date with her, and I found out that she wasn't afraid of work, she wasn't afraid of, of uh, uh, initiating uh, contacts. Uh, she was uh, a very bright girl, very, very lovely, and she wasn't rich. <laughs> I should say one thing. The house where we had the party was, the father was the electrician for the school. The lights went out that night. Oh no. A storm. It really was a storm. Oh, but he thinks I bribed the man to turn the lights on. Oh, that was our first kiss. <laughs> We both had to be in the kitchen at the same time. Uh, yeah, we were by ourselves, so nature <laughs> takes us course. And nothing else to do. Yeah. And the, in the 71 years since then, 71 some years since then, I have never had the slightest wish to change my mind to go back or anything. I got exactly the right woman. Oh, that's beautiful. And I chose the right man. Beautiful. <laughs> Any other questions? So, Value, you told this story about this fellow missing the fingers, and oh yeah, and that's a metaphor for the war. Yeah. Um, at the same time, are you are you glad that you served in that 
war, and here's what I mean, I mean, you know, all wars are awful, yeah. um, but for lack of a better way of putting it, I mean, the nice thing about World War II is that there really were clear evils that had to be put out of business, and you couldn't, you couldn't reason with Hitler and you couldn't reason with this military clique in Japan. They simply had to be defeated. Yeah. And somebody had to defeat them. And yeah. that this country played a major role in that. As awful as it was, are you are you glad that you still played a part in that project of putting those evils out of business? <coughs> yes. When Soldiers go into the service. It's the business of the army to break things and kill people. It was my business to put people back together and save their lives if possible. Mm. And I'm glad I had the opportunity to do that. If if I saw at any time the normal human reaction when you see somebody suffering is you want to help him. Well, that's the way I feel, I was able to help some people. Mm -hmm. Japanese and American. Yes, mm -hmm. and Filipino. And Filipino. Yeah. Well, well um, let me give the students one more shot. Anybody <laughs> have a question before we ask the last question? Yeah. What was kind of the return home like for you guys? Did you feel like you were able to adjust, adjust back into normal living, or was there kind of a recovery process? How did the how did the adjustment go? You you come home and and you know you get back into civilian life. How did that process go for you? <coughs> well, I'm glad you asked that question. Oh, uh, it went fairly well. Um, I had nothing to be ashamed of for what I did in the service, so I wasn't looking back on uh, on shooting anybody, and I was thankful for that. However. Uh, we were living in Phoenix at the time, <laughs> and right close to the, to the uh, approach, uh, air approach, uh, where the planes approached the field and came down low, we were, were quite close there. And two or three times I found myself rolling out of bed real quick and hitting the floor mm -hmm. uh, until I figured out I was back in civilian life. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only problem I had. And it wasn't on. Japanese dive bomber. No. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how to phrase this. Were, were people, were Americans upset um, about you deciding to be a non combatant? Mm. Or was that accepted yeah. because you were doing the valuable medic work? Did you, did, did, was anybody ever angry at you for? even though you serve, but for being a conscientious objector and not wanting to actually participate in combat, did you ever feel like uh, anybody was angry at you for that? Is that, is that yeah. Well, in the service you're going to meet all kinds of people. You're going to meet those that are believe in, in doing what's right, and you're going to believe meet other people. You'll meet people that try to keep their language reasonably clear, and acceptable, and you'll meet others that can't say three words without swearing. Uh, the the people I was with, almost without exception, were accepted me for what I just was. Uh, nobody ever criticized me for for studying the Bible or anything like that. There were times when officers <clears throat> would tell me I needed to learn to use a weapon. And I, I told them, I would tell them I was one AO, and that according to the law, it was not necessary for me to do that. And I said, besides, <clears throat> uh, at this point, if I went to use a weapon, having never had formal training, I'd probably be dan more danger than more, be more dangerous to my buddies on my right and my left than I would to the enemy ahead of me. <laughs> so I just make a joke about it. <laughs> yeah. But overall, it sounds like overall things went okay. Yeah. Because you're obviously working hard, obviously making a contribution. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, I was 
there were a few times when I thought, boy, I don't know about this. I kind of wish I had a gun now. But overall, I'm glad I didn't. I don't want to look back on and think, okay, I shot some some kid that was no no more smart about war than I was. <laughs> well, and, and the students in the America War uh, the America War class have heard other veterans talk about that. You know, just that those instances that come when you know you're looking directly at the enemy and you pull the trigger first, and that's how war is. But it's not an easy thing to. Well, there's not, probably not one soldier in ten that actually does that. Right. Yeah. But uh, you, you're always you have to be prepared for it. And so every soldier that goes in is expected to to use, learn to use weapons, uh, whether he's going to be a cook or a pilot or whatever he's going to be. Right. And he's expected to be able to use them. Uh, I took the other route. Sure. <laughs> I chose not to do that. And of course, I mean, in your war, you know, we were talking about these definite evils that have to be put out of existence. You know, you're going to have to have a lot of people who will pull the trigger. Yes. Right? But you're also going to need folks behind the line who are patching people up. And so the, the team works together. Well, the usual story is, you know, you, uh, you meet a 1AO and you say, well, what would happen, what would happen if this soldier was about to, to rape your mother or your daughter or something? And I said, I'd, I'd always say, well, I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably try to stop it, whatever means I had. If I had a weapon, I'd probably use it. But uh, sure. uh, under the circumstances in the service, I never had to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so there's a distinction between sort of the pacifist, no matter what, and then oh, the yeah. conscientious yeah. objection. Uh, anybody have a question? Well, let me just ask this last sure. one then. What, what, do you, what do you think that everyone should know about the Second World War? I mean, we're, you know, we're 70 decades, I mean, seven decades past the war now. Um, and there just aren't many people in the country who have a memory of it any longer. What, what do you think, what do you think is, the, is a really important thing that people should know about? The Second World War. Well, uh, <laughs> to be a little lighthearted about it, the, the usual answer to that question is, uh, well, we'd be speaking German or speaking Japanese by now. Yeah. If we hadn't fought back. Yeah. Meaning you had two, you know, um, what? I mean, two, Japan definitely wanted to rule the Pacific. Hitler yes. certainly wanted to, to rule Europe. Yeah, and, and Hitler had was had the delusions of grandeur that involved us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I, I think it's pretty clear that the world is better with both of those sides losing. I believe so. For all the world's problems. That's my feeling. That's my belief. That. Yeah. Well, I am. Uh, is there any anything else you'd like to say before we wrap this up? Um, yes, and that is to show the, the, demonstrate the cruelty of war, again, kind of like a metaphor for all wars, there was a young Filipino fishing, and the way they fished was to find a, a dud shell build a bonfire and melt the TNT out of it and then pour it into a piece of bamboo. And then they get a cap and, and t uh, get on the boat and the bomber <laughs> with this bamboo bomb stands at the front of the boat and on the prow of the boat. And when he sees a few school of fish down there, he lights a fuse, drops it, and then they paddle like mad to get away from the explosion. And they brought in a man one morning, a Filipino, that hadn't dropped it in time. He lost his face. He lost both hands. But we saved his life. We saved his life after a fashion. I'm not sure what kind of a life he had, but he was still breathing when we got done with him. And terribly wounded 
and no chance at all of living a normal life. And that again is, I think, a metaphor for all wars. There, that, those injuries that serious in all wars. And that makes me hope that there'll never be another one. <laughs> however, however, if I if there were another one, and my experience, my expertise was useful, and would save another li another life or ease another pain, ease somebody else's pain, I'd do it in a minute. Mm. <laughs> Bev, anything you'd like to say before we wrap it up? He said it all. <laughs> By the way, she had a lot to do with the book. Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna be able to have a copy of this, right? You can have that one. Oh. oh, this one here. And you can have this that has. The oh, great, on it. great. Well, we'll make some pages available to the students. So this is your memoir of of your time in the war. So looking forward to reading it. <laughs> and this has just been a, a real treat. Like I said, I, I was uh, disheartened because I thought that I'd lost contact and, and we wouldn't be able to bring you in. So I was really thrilled this morning uh, to get the note. And then, oh. and then you're so gracious to come in. I said, you know, can you come this evening? And you came. I'm, I'm really, really grateful. Yeah, well, we, we didn't want it to be this long, but the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Right. Yeah, <laughs> That's <laughs> Thank you very much for giving these, for most of these students, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to hear personally from a World War II veteran. Okay. So, so guys, what I want you to do is, um, those of you uh, who are in my class, obviously you need to stick around and, and take your quiz, but I'd like all of you to kind of circle, come around this way, and greet Belle and Bev on the way out. I'll set the quizzes up over there, and then you guys can pick up your quizzes, you can take a break, or you can just go, go right to the quiz, okay, when you're done. And when you're done with the quiz, uh, then uh, you know, then you're free to go. Okay. So just just come around, y'all. Be sure to thank them. Let's thank them now. With the <laughs>